Okay, everybody, welcome to Banjo, an Android disassembly for Binary Ninja, brought to you by Austin Rawls. Austin is a pen tester at Carve Systems, where he hacks things like IoT devices, Linux systems, binary protocols, networks, and Android apps. Outside of work, he competes in CTFs and RPI SEC. So please, without further ado, welcome Austin. Hi, I'm going to be talking about Banjo which is this uh, Android disassembler, which I wrote for Binary Ninja. Uh, before I start talking about that, uh, I have contact information. Um, the slides are up there at github.com slash carve systems slash presentations. And later today, I will be open sourcing the code for this too. I just haven't clicked the make public button yet. Um, feel free to get in touch with me after this with whatever. So I, I want to talk about a generally how Android works for the purposes of this tool. So Android apps are uh, APKs. And an APK is the equivalent of a jar in Java land. So Android is it's, it's similar to Java, but it's, it's slightly different. They, they went and tweaked some things. And so roughly the same thinking about it works, but you need different tools. So inside the APK, you'll have dex files. And dex means Dalvik executable, and it's the equivalent of a class file. Uh, and then it has Dalvik bytecode, which is the JVM bytecode. That's the, the meaty bits, the code. Uh, it's technically not Dalvik anymore. Uh, uh, so it's, um, it's technically not Dalvik anymore. It's art, but it's the same format. and. I'm, I'm skipping past ODEXs, CDEXs, VDEXs, all the other Android stuff. They change things. They add new encapsulations every couple of years, but we're not, we're not worrying about that. We're just going to talk about DEXs here, uh, which you can get from all the other things. So that's what it looks like. Whenever you reverse engineer it, you want to take that bytecode and then pull out something which is human readable. And uh, Android, Google did not make any format for this. They made the rest of it, but the community has agreed upon basically Smalley as a text representation for uh, the bytecode here. So the whole reverse engineering process, uh, Smalley is text readable. That's the, the goal there. The ecosystem, lands, the ecosystem for reverse engineering Android is a little bit different from compiled binary, so I wanted to give an overview of it. So um, on this graph, on the left side, you have low levels of analysis. You'll have just the plain text to disassembly. And on the right side, you have full decompilation trying to get source code back. And for compiled binaries, so like for ELFs, for x86, you have a lot of good options. For each of these cells, there are good, solid, well-developed options that have been around for a while. For Android applications, it looks a little bit different. For text disassembly, there's Backsmally. Now, Backsmally is basically the standard. It's a solid tool. It does a pretty good job. And uh, decompilation also has a bunch of good tools. Uh, this is different from x86 because the, the level between uh, compiled or VM code, so the JVM and the source code, that's not as far apart as it is for x86 bytecode and let's say C. So that's an easier tool, and there are a bunch of good decompilers. However, they're good in that they work pretty well, and they work a lot, but they, they aren't perfect. There are times when they fail, and whenever they fail, you have to go with backups from some of the center cells, um, which in compiled binaries, there are you know, good tools for. Uh, but for Android, I, I have been a little bit disappointed in these, these areas. So Banjo goes in that circle. That's the, the void, not the void, but the part where I was hoping to improve upon and add, contribute to. So this all started about a year ago when a coworker was reverse engineering an Android app, and there's a method where decompilation failed. And he asked, so what, I don't really want to read back Smalley. Are there any better options? Like, I don't want to just read text. I want something more interactive, more visual, um, maybe higher level. And so I told him that the things that I know about are you can get this, these graph viz PNG generators, and they will make a, um, a graph with all the basic blocks of Smalley, 
but they ended up being like these 10,000 by 10,000 pixel things and wherever you want to follow things, you need to scroll through the graph. And I don't know if you've ever tried to use one of these to reverse engineer. It is not a, uh, it's not a very good process. And there's also Radare 2, which has a text view, um, a, a text uh, interface, and Jeb. And I, Jeb costs a, a couple thousand dollars. I have not used Jeb. I don't know exactly what his capabilities are. So my coworker looked at these options and said, well, it sounds like R2 is the best option. It does a kind of graph view thing. Um, and so we ended up using that. And yeah, R2 is really the best tool for his specific task there given his circumstances, but I thought, man, it's not really right that R2 is the best task, the best tool for a certain task. So I set up with a goal to be better for this task than R2. That was my, my first main goal. And whenever I started doing this, I came up with a couple other goals to have an open source uh, disassembler and architecture plugin for Binary Ninja. Binary Ninja has a lot of uh, good plugins that are open source, but they tend to be on the, uh, simpler side, so like MSP430, NES, uh, those exist, but if you want to do something which has a lot of weird VM operations, uh, things that aren't found in uh, compiled binaries, and I'll, I'll talk more about these, the specifics of that later, there aren't that many open source options. So I want something that people can build on and the communi community can expand upon, learn from. And then also to have a Python disassembler library. I've, I've worked with some analysis tools for Android which have taken back Smalley's text output and then done text parsing on it. And that's not something I consider a good part of a robust analysis pipeline. So I'm gonna have something in Python that has an actual API. I, I, I have nothing against Java. I just, I don't really want to use it personally. I would rather use Python. So I made, Banjo, and that's what I'm here to talk about. It has a disassembler library in Python. This is pure Python 3.8. There are no, um, no dependencies. Uh, then there's the binary integration, binary ninja integration layer, which is the, uh, it, it uses the disassembler library and adds support to binary ninja for having graph view and the things that come with it. And then I also made a command line interface, which is kind of compatible with Maxmall. It's definitely not as featureful, and it, it's probably buggier at this point. But it kind of emulates the same output, just for testing purposes. And if you want to use that, all right, I'll, I'll show it to you. So in this case, uh, I'm going to be looking at this proxy handler, and let's just say I want to look at the proxy server. I want to figure out how the proxy server works. So you, know, you can start out with. Um, JADX, uh, which is a decompiler. And this will decompile it. And a lot of it is really good. Uh, you'll get like straight Java back. But let's let's look at the, the server part. It's like good Java. And then you find this this function, this method that it fails on. And you can read through the, the, the code here. And it's it's moderately readable disassembly, which is, you know fine and all, you can read this and it, it, it'll work, but you get to things like ifs and you have go-tos and you have a whole bunch of text with go-tos in it and reverse engineering that is a suboptimal experience. <laughs> so let's open it in Binary Ninja and switch to linear disassembly and this is uh, Binary Ninja which has used, which is used running my plugins code and so you have symbols here. I'm going to find the run function. This is the proxy server's run, and we get a graph view. So you can scroll down. You can see it has ifs. You can follow the branches, and something that you can also do, which you can really easily do with a graph view, is you can find loops. So you probably can't see this, but there's this really thin line which connecting a loop around here. So you found, we found the main loop, um, which would be, you would need to understand the entire thing before you did this with text, but with a graph view, it's just, it's, it's there. It makes that task simple. Another thing that having an interactive disassembler gets you is that whenever you have functions, there are, you can just click it and go there. 
Um, there are cross-references to, so you can see all the other methods, the functions that have used this function. And uh, you can use this to uh, more easily read small e code than you would with text. Mm, that's, yeah, that's what I wanted to do. So I want to talk a bit about the developing and how Android kind of works internally. So for x86, who recognizes what these are? So OX90, what does that disassemble to in x86? Yeah, it's a, it's a knob. Uh, what about 31C0? I, I know someone knows it. Uh, it's XOR EAX EAX. And does anyone know uh, what the last one is? The offset doesn't really matter, but yeah, yeah, it's a call. Uh, so for Smalley, things start out looking pretty similar. You have a couple bytes which are a knob. You have an XOR with two variables. And then you have the, 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 and the equivalent of a call is, looks like this. The first bytes are uh, the opcode. It's saying invoke direct, which is a call. And then the blue parts are an argument. And the orange parts are saying that it's method ID OX71. And what is, what, how, do you, how do you find what that is? I'll talk about that. Then the, the rest of it's blue parts. So you have method ID OX71. And you can see that here it disassembles to Java link object init and V means it returns a void. So let's, t let's talk about how we, uh, how we find that. So you go to the file header, you find method ID's offset, then you jump to OX71 times eight bytes into the section to find method ID. The method ID has class, <coughs> so the, the takeaway is that it's, it's complicated. There, there are a lot of steps here. Uh, if you see the, the part of the arrow, at that step, we are one third done with the disassembly of just the text. So this doesn't even tell you where in the binary the code for this call jumps to, just the text. The, there, there are a couple other thing, uh, interesting uh, takeaways here. Um, one is that the, whenever you want to uh, disassemble some bytes, they have different contexts in different bi uh, binaries. So if you took those same bytes and you found them in a different binary, they would have a different call target. And this doesn't make any sense for a hardware architecture. Like imagine a CPU where whenever you wanted to find out where to call to, you had to like load some other part of the binary. It would, it d that's not a sane hardware architecture. And so Binary Ninja was made with the assumption that you wouldn't need to do that which unfortunately is not the case here. Uh, another thing is that whenever you need to, um, you need to know, you need to be able to read a whole lot of different parts of the binary. And so you need some kind of uh, way to read those bytes and cache them. And Binary Ninja does not provide a great way to do that either. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to talk about some of the workarounds I use, but first just general Binary Ninja concepts, like real, real basic. The, the binary view is the plugin type that parses the file. So it'll parse the dex, uh, it'll parse an elf. It, it's what pulls out the where the segments are, where the code is in the file. Excuse me. And then the architecture plugin is a related plugin which does the actual disassembly. And this is what will disassemble x86 or Dalvik to Smalley. Then there's also LLIL which is the lifted language. Uh, Banjo does not use very much of that, uh, but that might be a future area of research. And that would be for more uh, intense analysis there. So I'm gonna talk about some of the hacky workarounds that I did. And with all of these, uh, I'm not saying that I know the best way to do this. There might be other ways, but I'm going to talk about what I did. So how do you read bytes at a specified offset from an architecture plugin? Well, I, what I did is I pre-computed lookup tables. So I, I went through and parsed the whole binary and then made this lookup table. And then at each instruction, I'd reference that whole lookup table. Uh, this involved. Uh, there's some parts that you need to look up other parts in the code. So I had to end up disassembling the entire binary in 
the, the binary parsing bit before I even got to the disassembly part of the code, which is slow and unoptimal. How do you access binary view data from an architecture plugin? Well, you can't. The two plugins are separate, and as far as I know, there's no in Python way to communicate between those two, so I used a side channel where I wrote everything to disk, and that's, uh, you, you end up with files that are hundreds of megabytes, and th that's also <laughs> suboptimal. Uh, how do you cache file-specific data in an architecture instance? Well, I don't know how to do this yet. If you know, please let me know. And why this is useful is that, or necessary is that each tab in a binary ninja window shares the same architecture instance. And so if you have two different dex files open, they're both sharing the same architecture instance. So they don't have separate contexts. And so uh, they, 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 break, basically. You, you, <laughs> currently, you can only use this plugin with one tab in a window. I would like to fix this. <laughs> uh, so whenever I was writing this, one of my, the, the, going back to the goals, one of them was to have a, um, an open source, um, something that did uh, complex things with Binary Ninja. And, I, I was looking, whenever I was developing, I was looking for uh, other examples, and I couldn't find enough that made certain tasks clear. Um, one, of, one example is that I, I was trying to make a, a switch instruction, so I asked, I couldn't figure out how to do it. I couldn't find any plugins that used that, uh, the specific method. And, and I asked a Binary Ninja developer, and he said, oh, I don't think anyone's ever actually used that feature before. Um, so hopefully now someone will and open source it or, yeah. Uh, so other of these things are what functions the architecture class do you actually need to implement and what do they need to, what functions them do you need to actually do? Well, I, I could tell you, but it wouldn't really make sense if you haven't tried to do this. And this is why I, I want to open source this and so in the future you can look at my code to reference this. Other things are like, how do you add a reference to another address? You wouldn't use the, the target parameter, you use the value parameter, which completely messes it up and th neither of them are documented in the Binary Ninja documentation. And other things like, how do you run a background thread? Uh, there's documentation, but it doesn't actually tell you how to use it, it just tells you what the methods are. So, um, I, I hope that this can, my code can prove useful to someone with the answers to these. This is my how the code makes me feel scale. On the left with two tiers are GitHub repos with no code in them. And I, I don't know if you've experienced this, but if you're looking at a readme and you think, wow, this is really cool, I can't wait to use this, and you scroll up and you see that, oh, there's no code in the repo, this was an aspirational readme. That's two tiers. And on the right, there's Space Shuttle software, which makes me big smiley. Uh, Banjo goes into the, the yellow area. It, it mostly works, but there are rough edges, and the rough edges are sometimes because I don't know how to do something, sometimes because I'm encountering issues with Binary Ninja. It's still in development. I encourage people to look at it, uh, file issues, um, let me know what you want to see, what doesn't work. I appreciate that. All right, so in chronological order, shout out to RPISEC uh, during college. They're a great community to uh, help me uh, learn how to hack things um, and really kept me going into this field. Then my current employer, Carve Systems, who uh, is paying me to do this, and I, I really appreciate that. And uh, Vector35 for making Binary Ninja. And um, yeah, uh, also to ShmooCon for hosting this whole thing, putting this together, inviting me. Thank you. Um, my, my contact information again, um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, 
Is there time for a question? One, one question, if anyone has a question. The question was, have I tried to use ODEXs, which are a more optimized format, to avoid some of the lookup table generation? Um, that's a good question. I hadn't thought of that. There are a couple reasons why I didn't do that. One, the DEX format is much better documented. Um, and uh, you don't always, yeah, I, I haven't looked into that more than that, really. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thanks.